God morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you this day and always. And may all that we think and say and do bring honor and praise to your holy name. Amen. I must confess that it is strange to deliver a sermon to a blank TV screen without the congregation present, without being able to see and to hear and to feel your presence. It is strange not to be together in person in worship. I guess it's another example in life of learning to appreciate and to be grateful for what we once had, especially when we do not have it. I do hope we're getting comfortable with this sermon on demand environment, but I must share that I'm still trying to get used to it. And I'm not sure I will ever get used to seeing an empty sanctuary. The empty sanctuary reminds me of a story of a young boy who was standing in the gathering place of his church, looking at the paintings and memorial plaques on the walls of the room. And it happened that the minister came along and he asked the boy what he was doing. The boy pointed to a wall plaque with a long list of names and he asked the pastor what the plaque with all the names on it was for. And the minister said, well, son, that's a list of members of our congregation who died in the service. And the boy paused for a moment and then he asked the pastor, Were they at the nine o'clock service or the 10 o'clock service? As you may be aware, this is the first of three sermons that I plan to share with you on the subject of grace. And these sermons form the basis of my doctoral presentation, which is titled Saving Grace, Preaching Grace for Spiritual Transformation. And I hope that you will help me complete my work on this by offering feedback on these messages over the course of the next few weeks. Today's message is titled, Saving Grace, God's Unconditional Love. And I'd like to have a conversation with you this morning about what grace is and what love has got to do with it. We know the word grace is used in many contexts Today, we say grace at meals, we give grace to others, we compliment others by calling them gracious. We are given grace periods in contracts. Our leaders sometimes fall from grace. Musicians refer to a grace note, and grace is a popular name. I have a granddaughter who is named Grace, and of course, we speak of the grace of God. But what does the phrase by the grace of God really mean? And what does God's grace really mean to us as Christians? Our scripture reading this morning is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. And Paul introduces his revelation that he received from Jesus that God is not just with us or around us, but that God is in us. This is Paul's first point, and it is his most important point. The concept that God is in us distinguishes the Christian faith from all other religious traditions. That is, the God of our religion is not a separate being or a person or an entity, but God instead is actually in each person who, has, who is a believer and who has faith. That is, God resides in each of us, and as God is in each of us, so we are born again as God's children, all of us. And then Paul makes his second point, that we are saved by grace alone. In Latin, the phrase is sola gratia, by grace alone. We are not saved by good works or by being a good person or by doing the right thing. Of course, we are expected, in fact, we're required as Christians to do all of those things. But the revelation of Paul is that we cannot earn our salvation. 
we cannot work our way into eternal life. Rather, our salvation was already earned and paid for by the sacrifice of God's only Son, Jesus Christ. And as the scriptures say, those who believe in Jesus will have the gift of eternal life in God's kingdom. This unearned and unmerited gift of eternal life is by the grace of God. Sola gratia, by grace alone. And Paul's final point in this scripture lesson this morning is that God's grace is based on God's unconditional love of all people. God loves all people unconditionally and without reservation because we are God's creation. God loves us as a parent loves a child and God loves us whether we have accepted Christ or not because the door to God is always open. Some 1,500 years ago, after Paul wrote his letter to the Galatians, a Catholic priest in Wittenberg, Germany, Martin Luther, saw this same revelation, that is, that God is in us. And this insight led to the Protestant Reformation. And so Lutheran theology was based on salvation by grace, based on faith alone, and not earned by good works or by merit. And today, some 2,000 years later, the American theologian Max Lucado has called grace God's best idea. Lucado points out that the idea of God being in us is unique to our Christian faith. No other religion or philosophy makes this claim. Muhammad does not dwell in Muslims. Buddha does not live in Buddhists. And philosophers from Aristotle and Socrates to Hugh Hefner do not reside in their followers. But by contrast, in the Christian faith, the creator does dwell in all people. And the Apostle Paul does not just mention this idea in passing. In his, his many writings, which make up most of the New Testament, Paul refers to God residing in each of us not once, not twice, but 216 times. And the Gospel of John, for example, refers to God being in us not once, but 26 times. When Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia, he said, it is impossible to earn redemption through the law of Moses or the Ten Commandments. Paul wrote that justification is only available through the faith of Jesus Christ. He says that when we accept Jesus and get born again, we are dead to the law. In other words, how we live has nothing to do with the law, but who we have become in Christ Jesus. As Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. According to Paul, if salvation came from observing the law, then the death of Christ was unnecessary and useless. When we live the way we used to before Christ came into our lives, then Christ died for nothing when he died for us. For Christ's death and resurrection is by the grace of God. So as the song says, what's love got to do with it? Well, let's begin by asking, how does God's grace express itself? By God's unconditional love for all people. Some of you are parents, and can you imagine sending your only son to a place where you know he will be rejected by the people, and then arrested, publicly scorned and humiliated, and then tortured, and finally killed? And his death would not be quick or painless, but it would be slow, agonizing, and painful. By crucifixion, hanging his body nailed to a wooden cross to die slowly, 
and painfully in the worst death invented by humans. Can you imagine? And yet, even on the cross, Christ gave grace to his enemies by asking for God's grace to forgive them. How do grace and love fit together for us as Christians? That God knowingly sacrificed his only son so that we might have eternal life is the ultimate and defining example of grace and the ultimate defining example of God's unconditional love of all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to us, that we might believe in Jesus and have eternal life. And if God can do that, then we can give grace and love to those who need it the most. We can love our neighbors, whoever those neighbors are, We can show our love for our neighbors and for God by helping our neighbors, especially those who need it the most. Those without a place to live or a safe place to live. Those without clothing, those without food, those without medical care. Those without someone to love them. Someone once pointed out that we are a society of rules. We need rules to regulate bad behavior. There are hundreds of rules in the workplace, hundreds of rules in sports and games, hundreds of rules in families. But God gave us only 10 rules to live by. And if we followed those 10 simple rules, our prisons would be empty and our lives would be better. And God gave us his son, Jesus, to show us how to live by God's rules. And Jesus modeled for us in his words, in his deeds, and in his teachings, what it means to live in grace and to live in unconditional love of all others. Jesus healed the sick, made the lame to walk, the blind to see, and Jesus raised the dead to life. Jesus lived among us not to condemn us for our sins, but to redeem us from our sins. By his actions, Jesus showed us the way to eternal life. And the Bible is full of examples of unconditional love. Take the story, for example, of the return of the prodigal son and the unconditional love of his father, or the story of Jesus sold into slavery by his brothers, or the story of the harlot who was about to be stoned under the law, but is redeemed by Jesus with the admonition, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. These stories and so many others reveal the Bible's unending theme of God's unconditional love for all people. Karl Barth was one of the most prolific theologians of the 20th century. He wrote some 60 works on Christian theology. And Barth was once asked, what was the most significant theological truth that he had learned in his many decades of study? He paused for a moment and he smiled and then he answered, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And we also know that the most important rule is that we love God and that we love others unconditionally. We know that when Jesus was asked what was the most important commandment, Jesus answered, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, he said. And the second is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. So when we are worried about the future, when we are worried about the COVID pandemic and its aftermath, the loss of loved ones, the loss of health, the loss of jobs, the loss of income, when we worry about these and so many other problems in life, God gives us the answer, grace. When we think about the meaning of life, its purpose, and what's it all about, 
God answers with one word, grace. When we think of the wasted years or the poor choices we have made or the regrets we have or what other people might think of us, God answers with one word, grace. And God is love. Love is not something that God chooses to give or do. It is the very essence of who God is. And God doesn't just love. God is love. And love motivates God's every action. And love reflects God's desires to be with us, in relationship us with us, and for us to love God. To be the best we can be. To love others as we love ourselves, without conditions, without limits, without earning love. For we can neither earn God's grace, nor can we earn God's love. They have already been given to us. And the focus of God's love is redemption. Adam and Eve walked with God until their desire for pleasure overcame their love for God. And this break in the relationship required redemption. And God's love for fallen humanity motivated the plan of salvation. Simply stated, salvation is a healing of the soul, bringing us back to and in full relationship with God the Creator. God wants us to walk with God, to be in relationship with God. And when times are tough, God wants us to know that God always has our backs. As the scriptures say, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so now I'd like to leave you with a question. Have you been changed by grace? Have you been strengthened by grace, softened by grace, emboldened by grace? Because grace can take us from insecure to secure, from fear to faith, from weakness to strength, from regret to redemption, from fear of death to the promise of eternal life. And as Max Lucado writes, when grace happens, we don't get a nice compliment from God. We get a new heart. Because grace is the voice within us that calls us to change and then gives us the power to pull it off. Lucado calls it a spiritual transplant. If you give your heart to God, God returns the favor. Tara and Todd Storch understood this as much as anyone. About 10 years ago, a skiing accident tragically took the life of their 13-year-old daughter, Taylor. What followed is every parent's nightmare. A funeral, a burial, a flood of questions, and endless tears. Taylor's parents decided to donate her organs to needy patients. And few people needed a heart more than Patricia Winters. Her heart had begun to fail five years earlier, leaving her too weak to do much more than sleep. Taylor's heart gave Patricia a fresh start on life. Taylor's mother had only one request. She wanted to hear the heart of her daughter. So Sarah, Tara, and Todd flew from Dallas to Phoenix and went to Patricia's home to listen to Taylor's heart. And when they arrived at Patricia's home, the two mothers embraced for a very long time. And then Patricia offered Tara and Todd a stethoscope. When they listened to the healthy rhythm, whose heart did they hear? Did they hear the still beating heart of their daughter? <laughs>
her heart indwells in a different body. But the heart they heard and felt is the heart of their beloved daughter. And when God hears your heart, does he not hear the still beating heart of his son? The grace of God is with us always. And God's unconditional love is with us always. For amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen.